everyone. This is Lecture 11, Systems Thinking, Policies, and Quality Management Systems. First, let's start off with some housekeeping. Please remember, Assignment 2 will be due this weekend. You may have noticed that I created a special discussion board for that, so feel free to ask many questions either in the faculty discussion board or the Assignment 2 discussion area for this week. I'm going to be posting a guest lecture of uh, Sandy Nearman, Director of Greensboro Public Libraries. Um, as usual, tremendous input in ideas as far as how she leads and governs uh, the Greensboro Public Libraries. She in many ways is homegrown here in Greensboro and again has a lot of um, great insight in terms of what it takes to be a leader and really the emphasis on customer service. This week uh, we will not have any discussions either group or team and really your focus is to focus on assignment two as well as your needs assessment. For this week's lecture, we're going to go over the midterm feedback, discuss systems thinking, continue our discussion on quality control and its relationship to policies, spend a little time on marketing, and then also link back to how particular system syncing and quality control are related to assignment two. Okay, so this graph here shows the student feedback in terms of on a scale of one to ten, one being the lowest, ten being the highest, satisfaction levels with each book. As you can see, um, first break all the rules, the second bar is by far the most popular book um, in terms of this slide that uh, well actually I'm not going to show you uh, the keep it or get rid of it uh, ninety percent said keep first break all the rules so certainly that is a uh, popular book uh, and pretty unanimous throughout the class raving fans um, is actually more popular than customer driven library as you can see that's bar one and bar four um, ultimately, the percentages work out to be pretty much the same for raving fans and customer-driven library. Uh, about 70% of the course like, likes those books, and then about 30% uh, of those re that who responded uh, did not. Uh, so I will have to take a look at both of those uh, and try to get a feel for if I can find um, a better book. Uh, or write some notes uh, and to replace those books. Uh, I'm not quite sure yet. In Raving fans, um, there is a newer a new book came, that came out last last year from Blanchard uh, and his son actually, um, but it's more of a traditional textbook. Uh, so I'm going to examine that to see whether Raving fans needs to be replaced by that. In terms of customer driven library, um, certainly that is a provocative book, and as you can tell, some really liked it and a number uh, really did not. Uh, and uh, Again, that uh, this book may be um, beyond its time in the sense that it was provocative uh, and really resonated, I think, more earlier. Uh, but as now many libraries have implemented uh, and changed over the last five years or so since the book came out, um, uh, certainly uh, some of the things she has to say uh, are no longer provocative, but uh, can be uh, certainly insulting, especially for books uh, for for libraries that are no longer uh, that way. Uh, and then primal leadership um, is something I also have to take a look at. I think that in general, um, the feedback still has been pretty positive. With that, um, the area of emotional intelligence, of course, is key. Uh, and uh, Goldman is um, one of the founders of emotional intelligence, so. Uh, part of me wants to really stick with um, the original source as far as this area, but certainly um, uh, we'll have to take a look and see if we can find a more updated 
uh, emotional intelligence uh, texts that might be more appropriate. So anyway, we greatly appreciate the feedback. Um, this is very valuable because um, in the end of course evaluation, uh, you know, that's by the university, so you won't have a chance to really speak directly to the book. So I really appreciate everybody's feedback. Uh, it was uh, very helpful. And as far as the overall satisfaction of the course, uh, you can see that um, the fifth bar, assignment one, clearly is the most popular of, of the uh, aspects of the course thus far, uh, which is not a surprise. Um, clearly, going into a actual library and speaking to real librarians as far as uh, those in the field actually leading uh, is always a valuable experience and so I'm glad that that continues to be very popular um, lectures I know those have been hit or miss uh, and I greatly apologize for that certainly those are things that uh, I'll continue to get better at as far as um, trying to teach this course online one thing I will say is that it's um, posting it on YouTube has taken an enormous amount of time as far as production goes. Uh, it takes on average uh, four hours for my laptop to generate the lecture uh, and then also to post it to YouTube. So it's it's almost a half day uh, activity. So if, if those of you who wonder why it's taken so long, uh, that's part of the problem. And of course, it's been wrought with uh, issues as far as recording, uh, my headphones not working, uh, so on and so forth. So anyway, I'm learning uh, and uh, I apologize for you guys having to be on the receiving end of the different ways in which I'm trying to deliver this course. Um, just so you know too that YouTube was um, introduced because of uh, platform issues. Some folks could not uh, hear my uh, PowerPoint um, with embedded audio, so that's why I went to YouTube, which of course is a movie and is much more uh, platform friendly uh, given all the different uh, ways people um, are accessing these lectures. So group work, always a grab bag. Um, you can see um, the rating of 8 was the most popular uh, rating. Uh, I think in general, of course, that depends on the group that you are working in uh, but but for me group work al although painful at times really is one of the more hands-on activities that you're going to do that you do for this course uh, because learning how to get along with others uh, and or to be flexible and creative uh, in particular for the needs assessment project and your library administrator interviews is really more realistic in terms of what you're going to see um, out there in your career uh, and it's my opinion that of course practice truly does make perfect and um, although this is just a class uh, your ability to think on your feet and still get along with others and solve problems sometimes complex and many of which are out of your control is really key and part of my goal is for all of the graduates of our program to have so much experience with that that in fact the practice of your career will be a heck of a lot easier uh, than uh, pursuing the degree itself which if it is the case means that we've done a great job uh, discussions um, Again, some mixed thoughts as far as the discussions. I know that redundancy certainly uh, continues to be an issue. Um, the team uh, activities that you do within your uh, group uh, pages is something that I tried uh, to uh, emulate as far as the face-to-face -face course. And of course, there's been some mixed results there. But really, um, one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of not... Um, Redundancy for redundancy's sake, but uh, replication is because um, it's my theory of learning uh, that uh, these concepts, although we've discussed, uh, can be learned at a deeper level uh, through repetition. The other is that, um, as you'll notice, um, you ha when you're a group, pay you have a limited small group, whereas the large group discussions, uh, you have the benefit of all your classmates. Um, and I encourage you to um, try to not necessarily or try to focus your discussions away from being redundant as much as possible which means uh, if you've spoken uh, or discussed one thing in your group area then certainly try to take on a different aspect in your your in the larger group discussions and, and vice versa so anyway I do hear your feedback there 
uh, read and reacts. Um, always um, some that, or actually many that really like it and some that do not. Uh, certainly uh, some of the feedback uh, that I've gotten on the negative end has, uh, has gone back to uh, it seems a little bit undergraduate and uh, undergraduate related uh, and again uh, my apologies uh, if it does come across that way but certainly the intent is not uh, just so you know um, this is a, a frequent activity uh, from Florida State uh, which is where uh, I taught for six years before I got here uh, and of course that's a very highly rated program and really uh, again how you handle the read and react is more important uh, and will delineate really uh, or determine how effective it actually is. So uh, those of you that feel that it's a bit sophomoreish uh, and uh, undergraduate, uh, again, I apologize for that. It's not intended for that. However, uh, it's not intended uh, to make sure you've read. Um, it is intended to uh, make sure that you have a deeper understanding of the major concepts of the book. Uh, and that's the purpose of that uh, on, on a graduate level. Again, my philosophy is not to just read it, but to really chew on it and discuss it and apply it. Uh, and so that's why I use them. Uh, and uh, again, frequently, uh, this distribution is pretty typical. Uh, the trend is much higher on the positive end in the end. I know it's a lot of work, but again, that's my goal is to have you learn uh, and walk away uh, being able to retrieve it uh, long after this course is done. As far as presentations go, I know that that also was a grab bag and there were some major issues re regarding getting it up into YouTube, again, largely due to the different platforms that uh, we're using throughout in this course as far as various students. Um, but again, I think the return on investment, although you may not see it now, will be, I think, very large in the future. Your ability and experience to do this uh, will be a huge boon for you uh, later on. Uh, you can you can guarantee that a lot of people don't know how to do what you now hopefully do know how to do, um, and that's going to give you a level of confidence. Um, keep in mind, too, that uh, as far as the accreditation process, one of the very comprehensive discussions we had with them is how we do teach our students technology, and one of the cultural values that we've adopted is um, being sure that technology is embedded throughout our courses uh, within the context of the work that's being done. And so certainly in a management course, your ability to pre present in multiple uh, mediums using multi uh, various types of technology is critical. Uh, and so that's why I really do think this is a good exercise. Uh, in addition, one of the common complaints in the face-to-face -face class uh, has always been that although the course, uh, I mean, the presentations are very valuable, uh, they do drag on a bit. Uh, and I think that uh, the YouTube um, aspect of it may be something that I'll use also for face-to-face uh, -face courses in the future as well. So, But anyway, I'm, I'm more than happy to continue discussing this with you. Again, I appreciate the feedback, uh, and feel free to take a look at uh, these charts, uh, of course, with more uh, and more with more time. Uh, to All right. Then, in general, um, overall course satisfaction. I'm I'm happy to say that the um, the purple are the nines, uh, which is the majority. Um, definitely the green, the tens, um, and the red. Uh, eights and the blue sevens uh, comprise the majority of the responses and I'm glad for that um, as always it's it's uh, satisfying for those of you that are not having a good experience uh, again I'm, I'm sorry that you're not uh, one thing I will say for those that um, were uh, particularly negative in your comments uh, just keep in mind several things one uh, as always, uh, your perspectives or the perspectives on anything will be different, uh, and I encourage uh, those of you that are, are angry or really are not enjoying the course to take some of the emotionality out of it, if possible, um, and to uh, try to work with me to make sure it's a good experience and to understand that it's my job not to be popular, per se, even though, of course, certainly that's something I want, but to make sure that you um, learn and hopefully are provided um, exposure to what um, we deem to be very important for you. Um, as you may be aware, uh, management and teamwork and communication are, are and continue to be 
the major um, skills that are being promoted by uh, ALA and by the employers and certainly by the administrators that I continue uh, to interview and that I'm sure you probably interviewed as well. So um, that's one of the primary, of course, facets of the course. Uh, and uh, I know that, uh, again, majority of you seem to be having a good experience. And for those of you that are not, again, let's try to work together to make sure uh, in the end it is a good experience. Uh, and again, uh, <clears throat> be uh, careful on not uh, being too hurtful or um, being too emotional as far as uh, when you don't feel uh, things are um, appropriate or you're getting as much as out of something as you wish you would. Um, because again, uh, reading those comments, of course, uh, can be hurtful, uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, you didn't intend to. Hopefully, um, you know, hurt my feelings or 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 go, you know, personal. Uh, but ultimately, um, it's not it's not a not always not a good feeling to engender. Uh, but it's certainly uh, not really a positive. Uh, there's not really a positive outcome I can see. Uh, from from getting that emotional uh, and 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 turning to negative. So please try to look look at this as an opportunity, especially as we go into the end of the semester, uh, and you look to evaluate your teammates uh, and yourself, uh, and then the course in general. Because uh, we do take the feedback very seriously, uh, and please uh, try to uh, remember again that uh, that your perspective uh, will not be shared uh, completely across the board. Uh, and so, especially again, if you if you have a negative perception, uh, you might want to ask yourself why others are having such a positive perception, and at least use that to to mitigate some of your frustration. Okay, so let's talk about the strengths of the course. Uh, one uh, student wrote that like he liked the emails and the reminders that I I post um, and. That uh, the assignments and readings are not particularly overwhelming. Of course, I know some of you are probably laughing at that, since some of you feel the, the exact reverse. Um, another, uh, you can tell they had a, a po have a positive team experience, uh, and they they like to text as well in the discussion boards. Uh, someone else mentioned, and this is always a common theme, how. You like the opportunity to speak to different administrators and hear from specific administrators, and I'm glad. Uh, and again, part of my uh, learning, teaching pedagogy is to give you a broad perspective on the field from the real deal. Uh, and I include that certainly um, uh, in my perspective as well as others. And, and really, you can rest assured that when you leave this course, you'll get a, you're, you're getting a very broad perspective from a lot of folks from a lot, many, many years of experience to help you um, learn faster and be more successful than us uh, at a faster pace. Okay, so ways to improve the course. I think, uh, so certainly this first one, uh, the first comment there talks about how in some ways there's too much reading, um, and maybe too much redundancy, uh, and uh, really hard to keep up with um, uh, with all that's being thrown at this person's, uh, at this person's way. Um, and uh, then they go on to talk about how um, the read and react again really they felt was uh, you know a little bit uh, below level as far as master's level work and this this person was a, sec a second uh, this is their second master's uh, and I can assure you uh, that it is master's level work um, and it's how you approach the assignment uh, again it, the perception is not to ensure that you've done a reading but in fact it is to ensure that you have walked away from the reading with uh, more than just a cursory glance. Uh, and and I, I completely agree that on one hand it should be expected that master students uh, uh, should be able to do that on their own. Uh, and uh, to a certain extent that's the case. But what I've found in the past, as, as also many top programs have found in the past, that if you do that, that the variability of um, uh, learning outcomes is very um, diverse and high. Uh, and that's why uh, I'm doing this. The, really, the key is to focus on making sure that overall the learning is high across the board. Uh, and then another discussion, um, the due dates uh, kind of being on the same day is a bit draining, uh, and I, I can certainly understand that. Uh, the reason why I set it up this way is because I do know that many of you work 
uh, and uh, my wife, having gone through an online program, uh, I've seen her as well, and uh, we all tend to wait to the weekend uh, when we have a little more time. Uh, and I guess the way to look at due dates, however, is that they're, of course, due dates. That means the last time you can turn something in, so it would, it would be hopeful that... Uh, if possible, uh, that uh, you know you could turn one of them in earlier uh, and then do the last one, uh, you know, at the end there on Sunday. But uh, it is a good uh, good point, um, and I could definitely consider that. And I'll look for more feedback on this one uh, as well. Maybe another time I can do on Monday. But again, my concern is that many are working by then. Uh, and uh, they'll have to turn it in Sunday anyway, uh, or just not get it done and wait wait too far to the last minute. So, but anyway, good feedback, and I'll definitely take that into consideration. As far as the read and reacts, and again, the the levels of work. Um, yes, I, I I I see that, hear that. Uh, maybe it's time to drop the third read and react altogether, uh, like we did this semester. Uh, and uh, slow down just a little bit. So I appreciate that feedback, and definitely uh, that might be something uh, to consider and, and way to uh, improve the course uh, in future versions. And again, as always, thank you very much for everybody's feedback. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about systems thinking and what that means. Well, the story of systems thinking really fast, uh, systems design, uh, comes from World War II. Uh, it's uh, really systems thinking is um, the field itself is considered is called instructional systems design, and that field really was created in World War II or before World War II uh, when the president called in the nation's leading psychologist to Washington D.C. And the problem was that. And, and here's the interesting strategic issue. The United States had a very small standing army at the time, uh, probably around 300,000 troops. Uh, and one of the strategic military decisions that Germany made was that the United States would be too weak uh, to really make a difference in the war because of that small standing army. Uh, and so when they plotted to start World War II, they banked on the fact that the United States, although they knew they would ally, uh, ally themselves with the Allies, uh, would, would have too small of a force to make a difference. And what happened is the president called in the leading psychologist uh, in the country uh, to see if they could help ramp up the um, standing military uh, quickly uh, because we realized that the World War, that World War II certainly was a significant conflict uh, and it really did endanger our way of life. And so what came out of that was was what's called instructional systems design or systems design uh, and really intent on um, developing systems of performance um, in, in, in as an efficient and effective way as possible. And so uh, what ended up happening is that uh, because the psychologists were able to use uh, their contemporary um, theories of learning uh, and, and uh, developing systems of efficient input and output, um, our standing army went from three, uh, 300,000 to uh, 3 million in a span of six months. Uh, and really, uh, the United States is uh, duly credited for winning World War II uh, because we were able to um, turn the tide in Europe, where essentially Europe was um, completely um, torn up because of years of war. Uh, and then you can, and then our fresh troops uh, kept um, uh, uh, landing in Europe. Uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds and thousands, millions of our troops uh, landing in Europe, uh, and really it turned the war. Uh, and there's a famous quote uh, from a uh, German general stating how, in fact, that was the case. Uh, that uh, really, once the United States joined the war and, able to, and we were able to produce that many troops quickly, uh, that we tr we truly uh, won the war for the Allies and truly worldwide. So, anyway, uh, in the end, though, systems thinking is really focused on ends, means, and processes, and we talked about that several times this semester. But really, if you can focus on that three-level type of thinking, where you have clear ends 
you have the means aligned to meet those ends, and then you have the processes defined in which to use those means, those resources, which are always finite and always limited in as an efficient and effective way as possible, uh, then you are operating and practicing systems thinking. What's interesting is that Molly Raphael, the LA, ALA president-elect who spoke at UNCG yesterday, uh, really talked about some of the same things. Um, she talked about, uh, and I included a link here, uh, which, uh, which is a video of her presentation, uh, that our profession really has gone from the inputs and outputs now to a focus on outcomes. And does that sound familiar? Uh, those are the ends. Really, the idea um, that she was trying to espouse is that it's incumbent upon libraries uh, to really clearly identify how our ends uh, are are impacting people in a significant way. That is, what are the outcomes? Not just what are the inputs and outputs, not, not just who attends or comes to a library, but more importantly, um, what impact uh, is that library having on that person, on that population, on that organization? So uh, really, um, I thought it very much tied to systems thinking in our course discussion that you have to have clear ends. Again, 3 plus 12, very much the three secrets uh, and the 12 questions come into play in uh, helping um, respond appropriately to Molly Raphael's challenge. And again, here's a link uh, to her presentation. Um, it's only about half an hour or so uh, before question and answer, so feel free to uh, take a look at that. Okay, the other aspect of uh, systems thinking, and again, why it's so effective is because ultimately uh, it views problems as a function or symptom of, um, of some type of failure within the system. Uh, and the reason why that's such a valuable way of looking at it is that for several reasons. One, you're not blaming the person or people or thing uh, where the problem occurs. You're, in fact, looking further back into the system to find out where that failure has occurred that led to the problem, uh, and by doing that, you can prevent that problem from reoccurring. And if you look at it another way, if you don't do that, then you and you just address the immediate problem without figuring out what um, the issue is with the entire system, then we call that a band-aid approach, where you just fix something, but you don't prevent it from happening again. And as you can imagine, if you don't find a real problem, uh, then that problem will recur again. Uh, and really, in many ways, that's very inefficient. Uh, not only wasting your time, but from a raving fan standpoint, clearly the consistency will be compromised uh, when you don't know where that error is coming from. Uh, also, the traditional model, classic systems uh, process model, is the ADDIE model. And those of you that are taking my web class, you've been exposed to this. I know we discussed about uh, the ADDIE model briefly also in a previous lecture. But really, the ADDIE model just talks about uh, systematically approaching the design and development and imp implementation of things. So uh, for anything you want to do, uh, you want to do an analysis as far as the purpose, the ends that, uh, again, the ends and means uh, and processes that uh, you are going to need uh, in which to um, create uh, some type of uh, system uh, that will perform or solve some type of problem. So you want to do the analysis first. So really, when you we talk about needs assessment, that really is uh, the, dat the data that needs to be gathered and analyzed to begin the whole process. So really, your needs assessment will be um, the first phase of the analysis phase. And then once, you, once you're done with the needs assessment, then you must design um, the solutions um, in which to uh, align, again, your resources to what you found in the needs assessment and your analysis thereof. So you design uh, the solution or service or, or uh, resource that will solve some type of problem or meet somebody's needs. Okay, and the, key, and the key is that by designing it is, again, you, you articulate what you're trying to achieve. You're articulating, again, ends, means, and processes as far as what you're trying to achieve, what you need to achieve it, uh, and uh, processes um, or guidelines in which to, to go about implementing the system. Uh, and only after you designed it uh, do you want to actually move towards developing it. And again, you can see how by removing the design phase and just trying to jump right from analysis to developing uh, is very problematic. Uh, and again, this goes back to the concepts of strategic planning and strategic thinking and prevention versus reaction. 
Okay, so after you've developed it, uh, uh, you want to implement it and keep in mind um, the concepts of formative evaluation uh, or evaluating it while it's in design and development is also, is also an aspect um, of usability testing and quality control uh, so that uh, you can fix it right away before it goes uh, all the way into implementation. Uh, then you implement and then you evaluate that implementation. And again, evaluation is a constant process of continuous improvement. And you can see is if you practice this, then uh, what you find in the evaluation uh, really uh, informs um, the uh, analysis phase or analyze phase and starts the whole process over again. So really, adding model, consider that. Uh, easy to remember uh, and always keep that in the back of your mind as far as uh, when you want to implement things and then also implement continuous improvement uh, in, in, in a rapid developing cycle that never stops. The other aspect of systems thinking is really linking them to the 12 questions and three secrets, right? So um, in the end, when you think about the 12 questions, that's a lot to consider. Really, the first six are the ones that you want to strategically um, meet on a consistent basis. And obviously, the systems thinking and systematic uh, systematicness in which you meet those um, 12 questions uh, really is critical. Uh, and obviously, the three secrets as well. Um, you know, uh, I know uh, Raving Pants talked a lot about uh, systems, especially uh, the example of Andrew needing to be in place in which to ensure consistency uh, and excellence and creativity and flexibility uh, in how the organization meets uh, people's needs. Uh, another um, aspect uh, is the principle five of quality management that was introduced last week. Uh, a system approach, a system approach to management, uh, and again, it really talks a lot about um, the need for alignment, the need for harmony, uh, clear ends, goals, and processes, uh, and again, very consistent uh, with what we just talked about. And having a system, a systematic approach to management, really is the key to um, being an efficient, effective manager or leader. All right, let's talk about the relationships between policies, procedures, and quality control. So first off, what is a policy? It's an official agreed upon statement of what should be, more or less, meaning that there is, of course, always wiggle room. Uh, but certainly, um, the more wiggle room, the more likely that policy will become a guideline. Um, and then the other question is, do you want to have more or less policies? And really the answer there is that you have to keep in mind the more rules there are, the more rules you have to remember to follow. And also remember this seminal rule, which is if you're not going to consistently back up the rule, then anarchy will prevail. Uh, and what that means is we've all been in organizations where there are rules that people wink, wink, uh, don't abide by, uh, and what ends up happening is that a, a culture is established where rules in general do not have to be followed. And so what I'm trying to say is that by having too many rules in which some rules are not um, adhered to or, or um, followed or addressed by management, then in, in essence it compromises all the rules, in particular the ones that are very important. So um, you can see how by having too many rules, you've unintentionally created a, a, an environment of anarchy where rules no longer apply or employees and patrons and customers routinely um, ignore them. Uh, and again, that's, that's definitely not a good way to go. So the answer really is less or best way to put it is um, having enough rules and policies in which you can actually back them up. Uh, and as uh, many of you listened to, to Mark Whitlock's um, uh, lecture, uh, he talked about uh, Bank of America and Nations Bank and how uh, one of the reasons why Bank of America was um, having issues in the, in, and was ultimately taken over by Nations Bank and, of course, the Bank of America name still uh, remained, uh, was because uh, Bank of America had gotten too bureaucratic with too many rules. And again, remember the concept of uh, raving fans and the idea of consistency. So don't have a rule unless it's important enough for everyone to do every single time. 
and it's important enough for your organization to back it up and to monitor it. Again, uh, too many rules means that your management becomes a, a, a monitoring uh, body as opposed to a supporting body. But policies are certainly great for governance purposes. So certainly HR, human resources are a must, clothes and appearance, behavior, vacation, benefits, and legal and expectations that uh, really are legal in nature. Also helps establish an annual schedule of events that you that the organization knows it needs to have, like day-to-day uh, -day operations um, or or retreats or things like that. So, what does a good policy look like? Good policy lists a, a set of consistent procedures to be followed. So overdue policies, computer usage policies, hours of operation, refusal of service policies. Again, you can see how all of those are areas that you don't want to be gray. Uh, they need to be very cut and dry, uh, which then really allows both the customer and the employee uh, to be in a good position uh, to operate in a consistent manner. And then the food and drink policy, I know that's been a, a discussion um, from Woodward's book, and I know uh, there has been a lot of divergence of thought there, uh, and ultimately, uh, whatever your organization decides on, it would be a good idea to have a policy, though, to make it clear on what those expectations are. Again, the other facet of uh, creating raving fans is the concept of flexibility. So... Um, you want to try and be fl as flexible as possible, which really means that you want to minimize your policies and have more guidelines or rules of thumb so that uh, it's, it, you, you've allowed your employees uh, to understand that they have the green light to not abide by them uh, if, if um, it's applicable. And again, um, having policies or having a minimal number of policies and then having uh, them backed up and supported by guidelines really helps establish this, an environment where the ends are focused on and not the means, which is that in the end it is about um, excellent customer service for patrons and users uh, while the organization is protected and not put in a position where they're spread too thin uh, or their, their actual rights um, are violated. So what does a bad policy look like? Too prescriptive and narrow. Focus on how to do it, not what the outcome is going to be. Not customer-centered, either for internal or external customers, which is that uh, a lot of discussion has gone on about, uh, again, from Woodward, about limited resources and closing on the weekends, which seems more like an employee-centered policy uh, than a customer center policy, and I have to agree with that. And I know some of you uh, defended vigorously, you know, that policy, uh, and you are right that it's not up to the employees, uh, but it does reflect um, a uh, possible poor judgment on management's uh, aspect, or even uh, a uh, punishment to uh, maybe patrons or a community that you f that uh, an organization for, or a library felt is not very supportive. But the bottom line is that uh, the customer uh, is not always right, but certainly should be the center uh, of, of a policy. And if it's not applicable in all cases, then it shouldn't be a policy. It should be a guideline. Um, but if it is applicable in all cases, it, it certainly should be user-centered, and that includes or customer-centered, and that includes your internal customers or employees uh, in terms of the delivery and then the level of friction uh, yeah, that uh, it might uh, cause uh, with external customers. And if you're also another problem would be if you have too many policies that cause inertia and then makes your organization and, more importantly, your management uh, kind of a police state uh, where everyone's a little bit cautious uh, and really the focus is on following the rules as opposed to uh, performing at a high level with a degree of flexibility and autonomy and a focus on meeting the needs of customers.
So how are policies, procedures, and quality control related? Remember, quality control represents the managing system that increases the likelihood of quality ends. And quality is all about prevention. Your policies need to promote prevention and multiple and, and multiple layers of prevention and inspection. So when you think about, for example, uh, hours, uh, the idea of um, preventing problems is to make sure everyone's clear on what the hours are and that those hours are consistently applied uh, and that your employees know that uh, if they've had a long day or have meetings or whatever uh, after the um, library closes that they can rely on, again, the consistency uh, of that policy uh, and the consistency that customers will, will respect that and abide by that. Uh, and again, the policies also help establish uh, those layers of prevention and inspection uh, by uh, having people roaming around, cleaning things up, fixing things, refining things, uh, and again, setting a, dire a general direction of the workflow uh, of, the, of employees so that it's not just a laissez-faire, uh, anything goes uh, type environment. And, and what I mean by that is, uh, again, having autonomy, but also having some direction. Uh, in which to direct that autonomy. Again, you want to look to establish policies to promote systems of processes to prevent and solve problems. Again, that emphasis on prevention. Prevention is a lot easier. Uh, it's a lot, a lot harder to do. But uh, if you, if the thought is put into it uh, and really defined by uh, problems, that is, uh, policies are designed to prevent future problems from occur problems from occurring in the future, um, then ultimately your system is going to run a lot smoother. And again, that is truly a management uh, leadership uh, role: is to figure out how to solve problems and prevent them from occurring again. And oftentimes, that leads to a good policy or guideline. Keep in mind too, again, the emphasis on guidelines over policies. That is, if it's not, if you're not sure, or it's not applicable in all cases, uh, or they already have too many policies, then you might want to call it a guideline or a rule of thumb. Make uh, make employees aware of it, but understand that it's just there to guide them in possibly preventing problems, but not to regulate them and and restrain them. So, how's quality management uh, work with libraries? Well, again, think about quality inputs. So what does that mean? Well, it means um, quality vendors, quality relationships with those vendors, uh, quality furniture, quality computers, uh, so on and so forth. So really, quality inputs means uh, that uh, what you have in your organization from top to bottom, including employees, is of, of the highest quality uh, that you can get. And certainly quality inputs as far as if you have a quality vendor, then your, uh, your patrons are also going to have a quality experience. Uh, and if you focus on quality from inside, then uh, of course you're going to have a higher likelihood of having a quality output uh, for, your, for your, both your employees and your uh, users and patrons. Uh, the other uh, f um, factors that you want to keep in mind are continuous improvement, which again, uh, no one's perfect all the time, uh, and really the key is to l um, implement, listen, refine, and keep uh, uh, improving uh, as as you move forward. And really, this is a process approach, uh, which is that. Uh, uh, given even quality inputs without the right processes, it's still not going to work. So what processes need to be in place, uh, actions of employees um, that uh, need to be in place to ensure a quality environment. And then again, the emphasis on prevention and um, as opposed to uh, prevention and reaction. Uh, certainly prevention is what I recommend. However, uh, as you learned last, uh, last week on uh, quality control, uh, invariably something will happen. Uh, you, you, you simply cannot control uh, all the parameters uh, and something will happen and uh, the organization must be ready and prepared and resilient to react uh, when necessary. However, the focus should be on prevention, but when invariably you do need to react, uh, you should do that as well.
Okay, so let's apply this concept to a five-star hotel. Certainly, five-star hotel customers are spending five-star money, and so the expectations are high. So given rules of quality control, this is how it might apply. So problems will invariably occur. All top-notch organizations recognize that. So what the processes that are in place as part of the system is that they will be identified and controlled. That is, problems will occur and that there is constant um, regulation uh, to make sure that they are identified as quickly as possible and controlled and prevented as much as possible. So the way to do that is to have a system with constant checks and balances. That is not just one person's responsibility, uh, but everybody's responsibility, really with management walking around, not just to chit-chat with employees, but to make sure things are running smoothly. So again, people that pay five-star money um, expect the experience to be top-notch. So that means everything from the website in terms of planning the vacation to the front desk uh, that you call or uh, the first people you see as you walk into the hotel. The rooms must be immaculate, clean, uh, and designed in a way uh, that are that is maxim that's maximally pleasing to the uh, patron. Uh, dining, of course, should be top notch, and certainly the facilities in general. And how do they do that? Well, they have clear goals and they have ideas of what excellence actually looks like. And those, those ideas are shared across staff. Uh, and certainly those are not pulled out of the hat. Uh, those are done through focus groups, needs assessments, uh, and, and patron customer feedback that defines uh, why they're really satisfied. The management is constantly on the move to, again, not to look over the shoulder of, of employees, but rather to make sure things are getting done uh, in, in the way that they, they expect them to get done. And certainly in a service industry, uh, oftentimes there are hard turnover positions, and those positions, of course, must be regulated and particularly very carefully. And that's where first break all rules comes into play, alignment of talents and jobs, especially for customer service. You want to put the people on your team uh, that, uh, that fit the, their skills the best uh, and lead to the best results for your customers. Of course, training and continuous improvement is constant. Um, if you think about a customer expectations change as the generations pass, certainly technology and fads and, and access to different uh, um, fun things and activities to do change, uh, the organization must also um, grow uh, with those changes. All right, so let's take this to a five-star library. Again, expectations are high. And given the rules of quality control, problems will invariably occur. And again, they must be identified and controlled. And certainly the emphasis should be on prevention with a system of constant checks and balances. Again, at the five-star library, the experience must be top-notch. So the website must, must be nice, the parking lot clean, and with plenty of parking, ideally. Uh, lots of signage. Uh, library materials are, are not only top-notch, but well aligned with the interests of, of the primary constituency that they serve. And services in general are not only polite and efficient, but again, uh, of high utility and interest uh, to the population that uses the library. And how is that done? Well, again, clear goals and ideas of what excellence looks like. And that really is part of your assignment, too, is to start drawing that vision of what that ideal library and experience looks like. Management will be in charge of ensuring that that vision is, is attained consistently uh, and that uh, folks are um, assigned uh, in the right places and that they're not having any problems. And again, training and continuous improvement 
uh, and, commu- and continuous communication is really key to this top-notch five-star library. And one of the facets there is cleaning is everyone's job, which you probably have heard, actually, especially from Mark Whitlock, is that leadership is not about top-down per se. It's about helping uh, ensure the success of the organization. And so cleaning in particular is everyone's job. Uh, the expectation is not to wait for the cleaning crew that night, but to make sure that everything is taken care of. And also that materials are replaced consistently. So from a budgeting standpoint, um, usage means needing to replace. I mean that if the, if if it is used, it will need to be repaired and replaced at some point. So on on the good on the uh, on on the positive hand, uh you have high usage. On the negative hand, uh you have high usage uh, and therefore high need for repair and maintenance. So make sure that constant cleanup, constant refinement, constant repair, constant replacement is part of the daily life of that five-star library because people love the library. People expect it to be of high quality, uh, and uh, the way to continue to deliver on those is to understand that if it's being used, it will need to be repaired or replaced uh, in the future. Okay, so let's figure out how this all applies to assignment two. Well, remember, uh, assignment two really is the ideal. Um, and pie in the sky thinking does have its place. However, the idea of systems thinking and the tools that I want you to speak to in assignment two, strategic planning, budgeting, needs assessment, and quality control really help build the systems, the framework, the foundation in which to build that ideal vision and not just build it, but again, in the spirit of raving fans in the, tw- in the 12 questions, build it in a way uh, where it's consistently providing high, excellent quality service for both internal employees and external customers. So for your assignment to spend time doing that pie-in-the-sky thinking, but also how these tools that, th- that were just discussed apply to your 3 plus 12 and will actually help make it happen. And you better believe that part of why I want you to do this is so that when you go into your careers, uh, you have this vision in mind. It can make and help be a, a, a source of positive change. Um, and uh, again, um, uh, our our constituency and Sandy actually just noted this at the, at our interview uh, that she really relies on us uh, to engender in students uh, new ways of thinking and and looking at things. So that when you're hired. Uh, The expectation is that you will bring new thoughts and energy uh, to um, their environment. Okay, let's touch touch base a little bit on marketing. So how does the need to do this differ between for-profit and non-profit? Well, uh, in many ways they are the same. Now, of course, for for for-profit, um, you are convincing people of, of a need that they may not have. And so certainly the urgency um, and some of the quote-unquote sliminess uh, are things that you don't necessarily need for nonprofit. But certainly as far as the, the similar elements, uh, they are relatively the same. So signage, talked a lot about that. Clearly that is important. Uh, and just because a library doesn't have much money does not mean that uh, nice signs cannot that ca- can cannot be made. Uh, certainly, uh, Microsoft Word, uh, Microsoft Publisher, uh, Adobe, Photoshop. There are many many uh, software tools uh, where nice signs can be made for very uh, very inexpensively. And again. For me, to be honest, um, as a customer and patron, I don't need um, immaculate signs. I just need signs that don't look horrible or beat up and tattered that show me where to go. Uh, The idea of internal marketing. Uh, So really the idea there is that um, within within any organization, the ability to uh, market your own department, your own employees, uh, your own role within the organization is also very important. Uh, And that definitely could be uh, to be present at meetings, 
uh, but also to be do a good job of uh, putting together some type of report uh, and really um, always being sure that your leader, manager, uh, and your group in general are um, articulating uh, your successes. Uh, it's all, it's important to be humble. I completely agree with that. But uh, to be humble to a fault, where people don't realize what you actually do, uh, is is uh, is self defeating. And I know, especially for school librarians, uh, the the constant um, uh, battle is with uh, teachers and how the school of, of, of views librarians, uh, not realizing that it is a master's level position. Uh, and not realizing that school librarians uh, are some of the most educated on the faculty and not realizing the level of complexity uh, in which uh, libraries help everyone uh, involved. So flyers um, are, of course, uh, kind of a given as far as uh, internal marketing for events and activities. Brochures, again, a, a more detailed flyer. Events and speaker series, um, uh, bringing things of value to your organization, um, as well as holding events, uh, again, that are of value to your organization. And then quality raving fan customer service. Uh, and what this means is that we probably don't talk enough about word of mouth and how by the fact that without doing anything, if you do consistently excellent customer service, people are going to talk. In fact, of course, the reverse is that uh, if you don't do very well with customer service, people are going to talk. So ultimately, um, one of the best ways to market your organization and your group is to do a great job. And people will respect that and talk about it and honor it. Now, how about external? Certainly the web is one of the primary keys. Uh, and again, uh, you know, as shown by the National um, Study on Website Design for Libraries, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, the uh, Taj Mahal of, of websites. It just, again, has to uh, adhere to the raving fan concept of consistency and flexibility uh, as far as making sure that it's up-to-date and provides useful information. Certainly media and news coverage, um, holding events, uh, where you bring in people of uh, media uh, uh, worthy um, note uh, would be important. That generates free, and free is very important. Uh, news coverage, uh, certainly, of course, sending um, press releases to uh, news agencies as well is very important. Again, flyers and brochures um, uh, uh, at different events to make sure that uh, people are aware of the services being provided by your organization. And of course, signage. Signage uh, everywhere from newspaper ads to certainly um, in your general vicinity. So the parking lot, uh, from the street, uh, front entrance, uh, stairwells, uh, you name it. But uh, signage, signage, signage. So again, it makes it very easy for people to find your organization. It makes it people. It makes it very easy for people to park, and and find where to go in, and find where to check in and check out, so on and so forth. And then certainly another aspect of uh, marketing is politics, uh, and uh, also organizational, which I discussed uh, in the internal marketing area. So when you think about politics, you, you think about, again, being aware of uh, who the politicians are and what the politics are. That is both citywide, countywide, within your organization, within libraries, within that county, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, again, that's one of the primary jobs of library administrators and leaders in particular is to be the face of the organization and be very active in that political dynamic. Again, um, the, the political, especially on the on the budget, the budgetary side, is critical, um, especially for public libraries and definitely academic and actually really all libraries. Being uh, part of that social political uh, context is critical to make sure that uh, you're you're um, seen and heard and people understand what you're doing, uh, and then you can advocate for your services.
And then when and how often, really it's all the time. Uh, basically, um, again, that ties to the one-third rule as far as having or needing someone, primarily the leader, as uh, Kim Ellis described in, in what he did, does for the High Point Public Library, uh, moving and shaking and moving and shaking while the rest of the folks actually do the day-to-day -day work. Um, and then let's take a look at the departmental marketing plan that uh, I developed for the department. Uh, take a uh, go ahead and uh, open that up in course documents and follow along. So part of our goal is to stay electronic and inexpensive. So one of the things we've done is sent emails out to all of the libraries, academic and public libraries in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia, uh, so that um, people are aware uh, of our program, aware that we are um, uh, one of the few accredited uh, programs uh, in, in each of the three states. Um, and more importantly, that we save um, printing and postage costs. And more importantly, on top of that, uh, is that um, when those emails arrive, they're forwarded to um, all of the staff uh, in a very quick and expensive way. We also have a Twitter feed, leveraging, again, Web 2.0 technology to uh, really be socially connected to those that might be interested in joining our program. And then targeted marketing. So as you'll note uh, um, by that document, uh, our research has shown that up to 50 to 75 percent of students um, or uh, that enter uh, are um, have some formal experience with libraries. Most of them are paraprofessionals, volunteers, interns, uh, so on and so forth. So that is a ready-made constituency uh, that uh, is the majority of students that uh, apply to uh, and pursue a professional MLS degree. So therefore, we must market to them. There's also a typical set of majors that uh, pursue MLIS degrees based on um, the data that we've we've gathered, uh, and again, uh, that that me that speaks to uh, going directly to them uh, because we know that uh, they represent the majority of students uh, that go from undergraduate to graduate uh, MLIS degrees. And then teachers. Uh, we know that teachers are the primary source for school librarians. Uh, and so you know, we want to emphasize the value of getting a master's degree um, and uh, also the process for getting a master's degree and, and uh, the true value of becoming a school librarian as opposed to a day to day teacher. And again, as I mentioned, uh, one of the vi viabilities of our marketing strategy is keeping it inexpensive, leveraging our knowledge and expertise with technology so that we can uh, uh, have a high return on investment and uh, a far reach uh, out to um, potential uh, students. Uh, I'm excited to say that uh, based on uh, today's statistics, uh, it does look like it's working. Um, uh, with a potential jump uh, in enrollment, large jump in enrollment starting in the fall, uh, although that will not be from the Charlotte group because Charlotte uh, certainly is, has, has a very negative climate for library positions, so therefore students uh, or actually a lot of the paraprofessionals that we would normally recruit from are no longer there, uh, but Greensboro is not in that situation uh, and looks like is going to not only make up for that uh, drop in Charlotte uh, enrollment, but actually exceed uh, enrollment so that we will actually have a larger um, uh, class coming up in the fall. So I'm excited to say that, uh, keep my fingers crossed, uh, it looks like that our program will actually grow, not shrink. Okay, um, we're nearing the end of uh, this week's lecture. Um, keep in mind that here's your weekly team calendar. Uh, we're in the week 12, so you want to make sure that you're in the data collection phase. Uh, we have time. You have time. So really this week, next week, uh, and then week 14, you want to go ahead and start finalizing your data and writing a report. And I've heard some groups are already writing um, your report that doesn't require data, which is actually um, very smart. And so you might want to consider that too, having some maybe not less involved and not as much involved in data collection, um, be writing uh, your uh, intro, uh, your method section, 
uh, and uh, anything else that they can do uh, while you're waiting for the data to come in. Uh, and then the final uh, week, um, um, week 15, I want you to post your YouTube video, which really doesn't need to be very long at all, five to ten slides, uh, really sharing again the story and what you learned uh, from your uh, final assignment. And I will have a, a more specific document uh, for that um, that you can follow for that presentation. Next week, we're going to talk about reinforcement theory and then start talking about the hiring and firing process. All right, well, that's it for this week. Thanks for tuning in, and as always, let me know if you have any questions, uh, and have a great week.